Hello, everyone. I'd love to be with you right now. Unfortunately, my schedule didn't cooperate, but I wanted to send you this video to tell you how much I appreciate your attendance at this summit and your participation in the Stepping Up initiative. One of the greatest challenges facing our country today is how to proactively identify and treat people suffering mental health problems. As many of you already know, the current research shows that one in five adults will suffer from a mental illness in their lifetime, yet there still remains a stigma associated with mental illness. One reason the stigma continues may be the fact that a large percentage of crime in the United States is committed by individuals who are suffering from a mental illness. In fact, every year, two million people with mental illness are sent to prison, making our correctional facilities the largest provider of mental health care in the United States. This country's criminal justice system was never designed to give individuals with mental illness the treatment to better their lives and to improve overall public safety. Instead, our policies primarily punish those with a mental illness or substance abuse problem, creating a vicious cycle with no end in sight. We must develop policies and tools to proactively identify people who need help in our communities before they offend. And for those suffering mental health issues who are not identified until they offend and enter our ju justice system, we must find a way to treat them, to release them to productive and healthy lives. This is why the Stepping Up initiative is so important. This is also why I've co-sponsored the Comprehensive Justice and Mental Health Act in Congress. This law will give correctional facilities the capability to identify and screen mental illness, assess and provide the clinical, medical, and social needs of inmates, and give appropriate treatment and services to those in need. Additionally, it will allow correctional facilities to develop and implement post-release transition plans for those suffering from mental illness. Last November, I also co-sponsored the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act of 2015. This proposed legislation will remove the cumbersome rules that prohibit funds from, for mentally ill patients while also funding advanced studies on the brain to better understand the cause of mental illness. It's crucial that we work to determine the causes of mental illness while also ensuring that those suffering get the help they greatly deserve. We can't continue to sweep these problems under the rug and ignore those who need our help the most. Just imagine the cost savings and the potential for economic growth if we can help one individual prevail over their mental illness to become a healthy and contributing member of our community. If policymakers, healthcare providers, and law enforcement can come together, in other words, if we can come together with solutions to help those with mental illness, we not only have the opportunity to help individuals struggling with mental health issues, we also have the potential for a healthier and safer society. With that, I want you to know how much I admire all the work that you are all doing. Everyone here today who worked on this summit, everyone from the National Association of Counties, the Council of State Governments, Justice Center, and the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, we are so grateful for your efforts to decrease the number of Americans who are suffering from mental illness in our correctional facilities. I look forward to working with all of you going forward, and if I can ever be of help to you, Please don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of your summit. Good afternoon, everybody. Whoa. Well, you didn't think there'd be a quiet voice coming out of this body, did you? Good afternoon. My name's John Wetzel. I'm the vice chair of the Justice Center. And as my colleague, our chairman, kicked you off, it's my job to uh, begin the closeout. And first of all, look around this room. Uh, you know, how many people have you, how many conferences have you been to where at this point in the conference, there's a whole lot of empty tables, right? So give yourself a round of applause for being a, a resilient crew. I gotta tell you, this is one of the most exciting conferences I've been to. And I hope that you understand, I hope that you feel the groundswell that you're creating. If you think of, I heard 3,069 counties uh, in America, and you hear 50 counties here to work on this effort that counties have been complaining about since we created counties, I believe. And you have the opportunity not just to participate, but to inform, to direct, 
and it's exciting. And one thing you'll know in working with the Council of State Governments Justice Center, if, if Mike Thompson's involved, you're going to be worked, all right? So I, I know you hustled around. You had uh, meeting after meeting after meeting and planning. And that's the easy part, right? And now you're going to go back to your jurisdiction, and you're going to get called by us all the time to see what you're doing, what you're doing, what you're doing. But what you're doing is changing the trajectory of mentally ill individuals in America uh, for the future. And that's just amazing. I hope that at some point on today, tomorrow, on your journey home, you just take stock at both the moment in time and the role that you're going to play uh, in changing the way uh, we deal with individuals with mental illness. Because honestly, if you look at all uh, public policy, there's not an area that's more of an embarrassment for us. But it, there's also not an area where we can have a bigger impact on people who, frankly, we should be having an impact on. And when you talk about impact, um, the, the lady I'm about to in introduce, that's really the epitome of her career and her legacy. Uh, Lori Garducci is the Director of Justice Reform at the Mac MacArthur Foundation. And there's nothing more you can say than the theme of this, stepping up. The MacArthur Foundation, under her leadership, has certainly stepped up in the area of progressive, forward-thinking, smart, effective criminal justice policy. And just when you thought they couldn't do anything bigger, right now, this initiative, focusing on, on 11 jurisdictions, has an, another potential to be a significant game changer in this field. So Lori, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and I by no means want you to think that just because MacArthur is shifting gears from juvenile justice to criminal justice that the game is over in juvenile justice. But it is, uh, I, th I think, this is dangerous. Uh, I want to do a shout out to the Council of State Governments, the uh, American Psychiatric Association, and the National Association of Counties for having the vision and the foresight to convene all of you to address a critical issue. Uh, as some of you know, uh, MacArthur in many respects has come full circle. One of the founding areas of the work of the foundation was actually in mental health. And one of our uh, earliest strategies with respect to working in this field was looking at the intersection of mental health and the criminal justice system. So it wasn't hard for us as we started to think about how we could capitalize on our experience in addressing the issues around the juvenile justice system of how we could build on what we had learned by working closely with counties in with state government to bring about systems change. And as we saw this historic moment arising now where you have consensus across the ideological spectrum about the need for criminal justice reform, what we saw was jail misuse and overuse, the unnecessary use of jails, had reached crisis proportions, yet it was a problem that had been overlooked in the reform landscape. And as we started to look at the numbers of 12 million admissions to jail uh, and how uh, the people who are going to jail are disproportionately uh, low-income people and from communities of color, uh, we saw this as a, both a major driver and a component of over-incarceration. Because jails have become warehouses for people too poor to post bail. Many of them are accused of nonviolent offenses, and too many of them suffer from mental health and substance use disorders. So this isn't only an issue for MacArthur with respect to criminal justice reform. It's also a matter of racial and social justice. So as this conference acknowledges, one of the important populations that has come into play as we started looking at the overuse and misuse of jails are people with mental health and substance use issues. Jails are our focal point, but what we are talking about is systemic reform. Because when people with mental health and substance use issues end up in jail, what we are confronting is our service system's failures. 
So momentum is growing to tackle this issue, issue is evidenced by, as John was saying, the number of people who stayed for lunch at a conference that's been going on for two and a half days. So what we have are local problems that need local solutions, but it's a national problem and issue in its scope. So last February, the foundation uh, released an RFP, a request for proposals. Uh, could I get the slide up, please? Uh, which reflected the safety and justice challenge competition. So we weren't sure as we issued this RFP because we saw jails and the misuse and overuse of jails as a problem hidden in plain sight, what the response would be for local jurisdictions to take into account how their systems were not working together and were leading to over-incarceration, how many jurisdictions would apply? We got 191 applications. And from that 191, we selected 20 to go through a very deliberate and structured decision, uh, strategic planning process where they had to map their system, look at their data, identify the drivers of their uh, jail population, where, where in their system they could intervene. And moreover, they had to do that with the coordination, cooperation, collaboration, and alignment of all their system stakeholders. Because what drives people into jail doesn't just begin with what happens at the jail house. It starts with that initial point of arrest. It's not just that initial contact with law enforcement. It's also whether or not the jail itself is using appropriate risk and screening tools to identify people who don't pose a risk to public safety. It's also when you get a timely appointment of a public defender. It's whether, how long does it take the prosecutor to review the case and decide whether or not to file charges? How long does the machinery of the court take to grind its way through the cases in order to come up for the trial and then finally make an adjudication? So what I think distinguishes these 20 jurisdictions is they took the ambitious task to heart they looked at their data, they came back to the, to the foundation with very ambitious proposals, targets to reduce their jail population by 15 to 35 percent over a three-year period. There were small jails, Mesa, Colorado had 239 beds, to large jails, Los Angeles had over 21,000 beds, and we picked a very diverse group of jurisdictions to participate in the challenge. And then uh, earlier, or last week actually, we made the announcement of the 11 jurisdictions that will receive grants between 1.5 million and 3.5 million over two years to take a deep dive in bringing about systemic ch change in their jails. The nine other jurisdictions, what we uh, would like them to do is to continue on the path to reform and in 2017, they'll have the opportunity to come back to the foundation to receive funding for continuing their work. Now, how do you translate the work in the Safety and Justice Challenge, this initial network of 20 jurisdictions, into having a national impact? And that's where we have also are investing in a robust set of communications activities and knowledge development activities. And we're very pleased to see many of our partner organizations involved because MacArthur isn't the right megaphone. It isn't the amplifier of the need to address the problem of the misuse and overuse of jails in our country. That has to be the professional practitioner and policy groups as well as leaders in this room. So we want to create opportunities for robust communications activities to get the word out. So we're partnering with groups like CSG and NACO, the groups that represent the prosecutors and the defenders, the groups that represent the courts to help us get out the word. So together, all of these activities amount to an initial down payment of $75 million that the foundation has put behind these efforts. And we're seeing innovative practices emerge from what we're supporting, and it's why meetings like this are so critically important. So we see in Charleston and Philadelphia a commitment to create triage centers to bring people who are, uh, have been screened to be 
at risk for mental health and substance use disorders to divert them early on before they even hit the jail. In Milwaukee and Pima County, for example, we're also seeing innovative practices about what happens at the door of the jail. We are also seeing increased investments being proposed in CIT training, partnerships with the county mental health programs and services, also with housing. So we're excited about the possibilities. There's a certain sense of hope, optimism, and urgency about bringing about reform. And these stories, these, uh, how reform works, how it doesn't work, the lessons learned, the resources, we're committed to documenting this progress and sharing it more broadly because we know there's a human toll to what happens in our jail. There are financial costs, there's the social impact, and we also have to recognize to bring about reform and criminal justice, we need all these other systems to cooperate with us. Because fundamentally, what we can say right now with the topic that you've been discussing at this meeting is that our criminal justice system, in so many respects, is broken. And that if we can't lift up the this system to be serve all people in a fair and equitable and just way. Our misuse and overuse of incarceration undermines the credibility and legitimacy of that system and causes us to lose faith in government action. And this leads to distrust and a lack of confidence in the rule of law. And there's nothing more important than restoring that confidence and faith in the rule of law and the importance of a fair, equitable, and just system. Uh, than the kind of work that all of you are in this room committed to doing. So I applaud your efforts. I look forward to hearing about the progress and also thinking about ways the Safety and Justice Challenge can work with you together to make this a national priority. So thank you for having me here. Thank you for your, commit, your passion and your commitment and dedication to these issues. Good afternoon. So as we approach the end of the summit, I want to take a moment to thank everyone for all the hard work that everyone has done during these two days. Um, I went to some of the small groups and just hearing all of the talks um, uh, in this room, there's been some really incredible collaborative work over the past two days. And I think we can all be really proud of that. Um, last night, how many people went to the Apex Awards dinner? Yeah, as you know, we had a packed house. We oversold the tickets. We, I don't know if everyone noticed, we had the residents up in the balcony. So, um, you know, they're young. They can walk up and <laughs> they can see really well. Um, but it was um, incredibly um, successful. And I think it's a testament to how big of an issue the decriminalization of the mentally ill has become. Um, and I know we know it from the counties, and we know it from the state governments, and we know it from people who are working in the justice system, but I hope everyone appreciates that for psychiatrists, it's also an incredibly important issue because unfortunately, that's where many of our patients are, and we need to keep them out of the jails. So, I come away from the summit feeling energized about this cause and more hopeful than ever for our chances of affecting meaningful change. And now the challenge, as everyone knows, um, is to carry that energy forward as we return to our home states and implement what we've learned in our own communities. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Commissioner Roy Brooks of Tarrant County, Texas. So Commissioner um, Brooks um, was elected second vice president of NACO in July 2015, so that means he's going to be president in 2017. Um, and he most recently served as chair of NACO's large urban county caucus which works to address the challenges facing the nation's 100 largest counties. For more than 30 years, Commissioner Brooks has represented his community as a volunteer, as a city official, and now as a county commissioner. So please join me in welcoming Commissioner Brooks to the stage.
always let the klutz speak last. <laughs> Ouch. Thank you, Dr. Bender, for your introduction. And thank you all for having attended this Stepping Up Summit the last two days. I have been so impressed with the county leaders and experts I've had a chance to meet and the presentations and discussions than I've been able to be a part of. And let me just say to the county leaders who are present today, your presence at this summit demonstrates the fact that we are about more than just roads and bridges and ports and capital infrastructure. Counties are people too. Yes. And if we don't invest in our human infrastructure just as we invest in our capital infrastructure, then we're going to lose the battle for quality of life in this country. So thank you all for being here so that we can make sure that our safety net is strong, that it has no holes the size of which will allow our residents to fall through and hit the ground with that proverbial splat. We are truly blessed that we have spent the past couple of days with some very smart and passionate people, all of you included. The Stepping Up Summit is not the end of stepping up, but the beginning of a movement to reduce mental illness in our jails. Counties are on the front line of serving people with mental illnesses. I'm from Tarrant County, Texas, and we've got a pretty substantial delegation here today. But let me just say thank you to the MacArthur Foundation because we as a county came together around the subject of providing services to mentally ill persons in our jail system by putting a, together a response to the MacArthur request for proposals. Now, we didn't get the money. We didn't even get the planning money. <laughs> but we decided that this issue was important enough to us as commissioners and that we had enough resources of our own in our own county that we could continue the effort that we began through our Criminal Justice Planning Council and other stakeholders to do this work ourselves and to finance this work ourselves. In order to do that, we partnered with a local university to help us study who's in our jail, why are they in our jail, are they there because they're a danger and a threat to public safety? Or are they there because they're mentally ill? Or are they there simply because they can't afford to write a check to get out? This work is ongoing in our community. And let me also thank TASC, Treatment Alternatives for Safe Communities, 
They are present all over this hall. They have joined our collaboration and together we're making progress towards emptying our jail of mentally ill persons and ending over incarceration of people of color and poor persons in our community. So thank you, Laurie, for catalyzing this effort, not only in Tarrant County, but in communities across this country. We look forward to going home with the teams that we brought here to put some of our ideas into practice. For instance, I learned that data is king and that that data exists all over our county in little silos. And I've learned that in order to make this data work for us, we've got to bust up those silos. We've got to reach across competing turfs and share not only data but resources to make our county function better for all of its people. I hope all of you leave this summit feeling the same way that I do, energized about taking this critical work to the next level. And we must continue to support one another. Use those business cards you've exchanged. Call on each other for help and for ideas. Let's continue the momentum we built and expand it to counties that were not here, but who may be here the next time. Share what you've learned with your partners at home and in your states and across this country. Stepping up is about creating opportunities for counties to learn from each other and to build the best systems we can to serve people with mental illness. Let's make this happen. Thank you for being here. And thank you for your commitment to this important issue. NACO and the Stepping Up Partners support you and look forward to hearing about what you've accomplished back home. And before we go, let's give a round of applause to all of the experts, partners, sponsors, and staff who have made this event possible. Thank you all. So for our final speaker, we have Deputy Attorney General um, Sally Yates. Um, prior to her confirmation as Deputy Attorney General, uh, Ms. Yates has the distinction of being the first woman to serve as a U.S. Attorney in the Northern District of Georgia. She has spent most of her career in public service and has 25 years of experience as a prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Please join me in welcoming Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates. Well, thank you, Dr. Binder. And I also want to thank the National Association of Counties and the CSG Justice Center and the APA Foundation for making this summit possible. The Department of Justice, and particularly our Office of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, is really proud to be able to support you in these efforts. And I want to tell you that I am proud to be with you here today. By your presence here, you have demonstrated that you not only recognize the seriousness of the mental health crisis that we are facing, 
but you're actually doing something about it. You all know better than I do the factors that led us here today to, to the current mental health crisis where we find ourselves, including the failure to replace the shuttered state-run psychiatric facilities with adequate community-based mental health services. This has left far too many of our fellow citizens to fend for themselves, particularly those that don't have the means to be able to afford mental health care treatment. As a result, it's no surprise that places like the LA County Jail and Rikers Island actually have more um, individuals there for psychiatric treatment than any psychiatric facility across the country. Requiring our strained criminal justice system to do double duty as the front line for mental health services is not only inefficient, it is totally inconsistent with our values and who we are as a country. This just simply isn't the way we treat our fellow citizens. While fortunately the Affordable Care Act has made mental health treatment more available for more of our citizens, we still need comprehensive mental health justice reform. And we need this reform really to address the intersection of mental health issues with the criminal justice system. But rather than waiting for Congress to act, you all have stepped up to meet the needs of the communities that you serve and the citizens that are back home in those communities. And I'm confident that the steps that you're taking are gonna make real and measurable change in your communities. And just as importantly, I believe that it's going to build a momentum for nationwide change. Now, attitudes toward mental illness have come a long way, but far too many people still stigmatize the mentally ill in looking at it as something of personal weakness or, or a lack of character. But we all know that individuals living with mental health conditions are more than their diagnosis. They're our colleagues and our college roommates. They're our children and our friends. And they shouldn't have to struggle alone. But far too many have fallen through cracks that have really become canyons. And they're landing in a criminal justice system that is really ill-equipped to address their needs. Our current system, I believe, is really unfair both to those who are struggling with mental illness and also it's unfair to law enforcement and our correctional personnel who really lack the expertise and the resources to be able to address these situations. And this is taking a huge toll on our communities. In 2000, 2009, as you all probably know, CSG Justice Center estimated that over two million adults with serious mental illness entered American jails over the course of just a single year. And once incarcerated, we also know that those with serious mental illness are much more likely to spend a lot more time in prison and to deal with a whole variety of issues while they are in prison. All of this inevitably takes a toll on the inmates who not only have to deal with the struggles of being incarcerated, but also trying to cope with their mental illness as well. And it takes a toll on our correctional facilities that are already stretched way too thin, and they end up having to manage the inmates that are there rather than to treat them. And so the vicious cycle just continues. Over the last two days, you've heard from people who are working on the front lines to address mental illness in the criminal justice system. And we recognize at the Department of Justice that we need to be doing a whole lot more to address these issues. That's why summits like this, I think, are so important. Not only do you have an opportunity to learn from each other and to learn from true experts in the field, but at the Department of Justice, we have an opportunity to learn from you. We have an opportunity to hear from you all firsthand about what you need and how we can best assist you in your local communities. And so after this summit, I'm looking forward to meeting with Denise and the others who have been here throughout the summit to hear from them how we can best assist you at DOJ. We are really making a concerted effort to sharpen our focus at the Department of Justice on mental health issues. And we're doing this both to try to figure out what we can be doing at the federal level and how we can best assist our state and local counterparts as well. And while we have a whole lot more to learn, there are some things that we know we need to be doing and we know we need to be addressing. And so we've been looking at the intersection of mental health and the criminal justice system essentially in, in three buckets or three points. Interaction with the mentally ill by law enforcement in the community, 
diversion to mental health treatment from incarceration and treatment while um, the mentally ill are in fact incar incarcerated. And so, in other words, we're looking at how the criminal justice system interacts with those who are mentally ill, both on the community, in the streets, in the courtroom, and the cell block. So if you think first about the street corner, which is really the place where most who are mentally ill come in contact with the criminal justice system. And that's oftentimes with law enforcement when they encounter someone that is there. And we're working with law enforcement officers to try to be able to identify the signs of mental illness so that law enforcement officers can de-escalate in those situations and be able to divert those individuals to mental health treatment rather than necessarily incarceration. And we all know that when an officer responds to a scene, it can oftentimes be difficult to know whether this is a dangerous criminal or somebody who is experiencing a mental health crisis or both, and it can be both. And so it's difficult for the officer to know sometimes whether this is someone who poses a genuine threat to them or to others in the community. And when I speak with my state and local counterparts in law enforcement, they tell me that this is the most significant issue that they are facing today, is how to deal, deal with the mentally ill in their communities. So one of the challenges that we're trying to address, as I mentioned, is, is in educating law enforcement officers about how to handle these difficult situations. So hopefully it will be easier for them to do their job safely and effectively but also to increase the likelihood that those who are suffering with mental illness will actually get treatment rather than just being incarcerated. And we recognize in all of this, there's not gonna be any sort of one size fits all for every community that's, that's here today. And that one of the most important things that we've learned is that you all obviously have to think about what are the mental health resources that you have available in your community in fashioning how that you're going to approach this. And so, um, through the Department of Justice, we have been working with communities to develop um, crisis intervention teams, or CITs, that I would expect you've probably talked about here over the course of the conference, that link these specially trained officers with a network of mental health professionals in the individual communities who can provide support when one of these crisis situations arises. You know, just one example that I was told about that came up in Portland, Oregon, not too long ago. Our Civil Rights Division had worked with Portland in the context of a civil rights investigation about putting together some reforms and how they were interacting with the mentally ill. And in the course of that, they developed a CIT. Well, not long after all of this happened, there was a call there to the police department and they arrived at the scene where there was a naked man there standing on a ledge with a big knife who was threatening them and threat also threatening to jump. Well, one of the officers that arrived at the scene had recently been through this CIT training. And when he was there, instead of reacting with force, he started talking with this individual. And it, it became clear that this man, I mean, you would need a whole lot of training to know that this person is probably suffering from a mental health crisis there, but he also was cutting himself with the knife. And so rather again in engaging in violence, he began engaging in a conversation, a dialogue with this man, and the man told him that he was hungry. And so one of the other officers actually ran over to a local hotel and bought a sandwich and brought it back. And they you know, put, it, put that down for the man that was there. And through the course of this conversation, they were able to talk him off the ledge to be able to take him into custody and then take him to a local hospital for evaluation and treatment. This is just one little example, and I'm sure all of you all could probably tell tens or hundreds of these kind of stories from your experience, but this is just one example of where the proper kind of training can de-escalate a dangerous situation and get one of our fellow citizens to treatment that they need. And so our Bureau of Justice Assistance is working with our partners across the country to develop a customizable curriculum that will help jurisdictions develop programs that will work for them. And the idea behind this is that there would be certain training modules that would include different types of best practices from which local communities then could pick what would work best for them in their communities based on the type of mental health services that they have available for them there. Um, we hope to launch a pilot training program of this in some select jurisdictions this summer. And this is just one of the projects that's underway at B BJA. Since 2004, when Congress authorized the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Reform Program, 
BJA has distributed more than $8 million to jurisdictions across the country to deal with mental health and substance abuse treatment. And we're looking forward to being able to continue additional support in the future. Now, one way to divert the mentally ill from incarceration to treatment is, as I just described, when cops are out on the street. But there's also a second opportunity that we have to divert the mentally ill, and that's after they come into custody. There are some individuals who need to be arrested, after, particularly after they've committed a serious or a violent crime. But there are several post-arrest diversion um, strategies that, that are available. In, in some courts, for example, the courts actually employ mental health counselors or workers to, to screen the individuals that are coming in to the courtroom there, either in local jails or at courthouses, and to then advise the judge, as well as the prosecutors and defense attorneys, about the possible presence of mental illness and to suggest options for assessment and perhaps diversion from prison to treatment instead. Alternatively, some courts, rather than actually having mental health experts that are part of their courts, will have um, developed collaborative relationships with public health services in their communities. And they go through the same type of assessments there and provide advice to the court and prosecutors and defense attorneys as well. And a third approach is the development of an entirely separate docket that I'm sure you all have heard about, and maybe some of you all have mental health courts. Um, mental health courts, the purpose of these courts is to take individuals who have come into the criminal justice system and rather than just thinking about punishment, again, thinking about treatment and other problem-solving strategies that will help to reduce recidivism in our communities as well. And when these courts are done right, the evidence that we have so far is that they can be very, very effective. You all may know about one mental health court, for example, in, Bronx, in the Bronx in New York. And that program, um, the, the defendants there are screened for eligibility and they enter the court through a formal plea process. They're matched with community-based treatment and then they participate in court monitoring and case management and intensive mental health treatment. And the length of this treatment varies depending on the offense that they've committed. For misdemeanors, it's about six months and for felonies, it can be about 18 months to two years. But a recent academic, outside academic study of this program found that the participants there were less likely to recidivate, to offend again, and this is really important for public safety folks, were far less likely to reoffend with violent or other serious offenses. And so all of us, I think, have an obligation to do what we can to support these courts and to consider whether they might work in our home communities. But we recognize at the Department of Justice that even with the best diversion and de-escalation programs, that's not going to free our prisons and jails of those with mental illness. And that's why the third place that they we're focused at the department is in the cell block. Our correctional facilities are always going to have some inmates who entered with mental illness or perhaps developed mental illness once they're in the prison system. And it's our responsibility, I believe, to do everything that we can to equip these individuals to be able to be successful when they ultimately leave the prison system. And so the Federal Bureau of Prisons is reviewing and revising the standards of treatment and care of inmates with mental illness who are in federal custody. And while there's still a whole lot more to be done, the project resulted in several important changes within BOP and laid the groundwork for some additional changes that will be made in the months and years to come. But one thing I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience is that providing the necessary treatment is going to require additional resources. Over the past several decades in federal prisons and in state prisons, we've seen the prison population expand at much greater rates than our prison personnel are expanding. And we know that you have to have specially trained mental health specialists to be able to provide the real mental health treatment that these inmates need. And so the growing prison population without the corresponding growing um, BOP population has put a real strain on, our, on the services that are, are able to be provided by BOP. But we're going to continue working with Congress to try to explain to them how absolutely critical it is that they allocate sufficient resources for us to be able to provide the kind of mental health services that I believe we have an obligation to provide. And we're going to continue also to be telling Congress that they need to provide it, be providing those same, that same assistance, those same services 
to those of you in your local and state facilities as well. But with all of this, you know, none of us here are operating under any illusions that we all have our work cut out for us here. And that's part of why I so admire your initiative and your determination to raise your hands and want to be here today to do something about this. You know, the mentally ill, and particularly inmates who are mentally ill, they're not exactly a powerful constituency. They don't have a lot of juice. But how we as a society treat the most vulnerable among us defines who we are. And that's why I so admire, again, what you all are doing here today, of just grabbing this and being determined to do something about it. And I can assure you that at the Department of Justice, we're going to be there with you every step of the way. So thank you all for being here today. And I am told I am supposed to tell you this is the end of the conference now. <laughs> so go forth and do good. Thank you.